last night. Me. Last night. Mm. Yes. That was Mosey's song. Mm. Mm. All right. Yeah, that's all. I've been I've been listening to that song all week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, amen. All right, let's pray. We get started. Let's get started. Father, again today, we thank you for the privilege, Lord, to come before you. And we do thank you today for the great love that you have for us, Lord. That we might be called children of God, sons of God. Thank you, Lord. Uh, realizing, Lord, that you first loved us, Lord, and you demonstrated it by coming to get us, Lord, and to send your son to die for us, and we thank you for that. And so right now, Lord, we pray that you'll bless our time, that you'll speak, uh, speak to the hearts of your people, that you again fill and fill in as only you can. And we thank you again for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. Get my screen working here again. We will open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter four. Um, again, we're coming down the home stretch of this book. Um, I think the Lord's had a lot to say in this book. <laughs> He's had a lot to say. And uh, so we're coming down the home stretch now, Colossians chapter four. And I'm going to begin reading at verse five, okay? Verse five. Um, the scripture says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time, and let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you are to answer each one. And Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. And I'll stop there. I'm not sure how far we're going to go get, but I'll stop there. Now, just as a quick review, you know, last week we, we were talking about this issue in verse five, talking about being prudent in character, okay? And we talked about guarding our testimony and the whole idea of walking in wisdom and walking carefully. This is how we kind of left off last week. And we talked, some of the things we talked about, one of the things we talked about in terms of, you know, guarding our testimony um, is the fact that if, if, if we have an unsaved boss, you know, that boss might not listen to the employee's testimony if he always sees that employee's lagging off at work, okay? You know, it kind of tarnishes my testimony if, uh, you know, I can't be trusted when the boss not around. Remember before we talked about the whole issue of eye service back in chapter three, you know, I, I work and I do my best when he's around, but when he's not around, I'm not doing much, okay? It kind of tarnishes the testimony. And also, remember last week, we talked about the idea of the married couple. You know, you go to church every week, but come home fussing and fighting all week. You know, the neighborhood, the neighbors see that. They see you leave the church, but what are they hearing uh, Monday, or well, better yet, Sunday afternoon through Saturday, okay? We come home to church and, you know, fussing and fighting and, those things kind of uh, tarnish the testimony. Um, it's like, well, what are they going to church for? You know, you know what I mean? So the whole idea of walking carefully. And we said we are, lived, we are called to live in a way where we establish the credibility of the faith. Because as, as we said last week, is the idea that people will, uh, they watch more what you do than what you say. You know, my walk, how I talk, all of that will have greater impact than what I said, okay? We are called to live in a way where we establish the credibility of the faith. You know, if I'm telling people I'm saved, I know Jesus, but my lifestyle is completely different, what do you think people are going to believe? They're going to believe what they see versus what they hear, okay? So we have to live in a way where we establish the credibility 
of the faith. So now in verse five, he goes on to talk about this issue of redeeming the time, okay? Redeeming the time, verse five. Now in the Greek, that phrase means to improve the opportunity. Okay, you improve the opportunity, redeeming the time. Now, uh, just remember this fact in terms of improving the opportunity. You know, everything we have opportunity to do is privilege. Everything. I mean, listen, the Lord doesn't need me. Whatever the reason, he allows me the privilege to be a part of what he's doing. He doesn't need me. So that's why we have to improve the opportunities that the Lord has given us. Redeem the time, the season he's given us to serve, you know, make the best of it. Do the best that we very can, that we can. Now, as I said, the word used for time, you know, in that verse in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, um, he says, uh, in fact, let me let me just read that verse real quick. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, in fact, starting at verse 15, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, which means carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Okay, the idea is seasons of time. It literally means opportunity because in these days that we're living in uh you know the return of the lord is not long so we have to work while it's day because you know night's coming we won't be able to work that's what the scripture says it means seize the opportunity okay guard our testimony now also not only is there a call to walk carefully but also there is a call to talk Right, because we just kind of talked about that. The idea of our testimony is not just in how we walk and how we live, but it's also in how we talk. Okay, verse six says that he says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. The call is to talk. Okay, now, now don't just walk carefully, but talk carefully. Be careful in what you say. Okay, talk carefully. Why? He says that our speech is to be graceful. In other words, it's seasoned with salt. You know, uh, it, it, it's the idea of um, how do I say what I say? You know, you can say the same thing two different ways, and it can be taken two different ways. Why? Because I haven't seasoned what I say. They season it with grace. He uses the idea of salt, the idea of seasoning it with grace. Now, now remember, when I come before somebody to talk to them, I have to remember that I could be on the other side of that table. Okay, because maybe, cause think about it like this. You could be confronting somebody because of a sin issue. Maybe they fell, whatever it is. The idea is the reason why I season it is because I have to remember that could be me on the other side of that. Somebody could be confronting me. How would I want to be confronted? Season it with grace, season it with salt when I talk, okay? Um, speak with grace from the heart and on our lips. Be graceful, be graceful. And even when I have to confront somebody, the idea is that I confront to win. I don't confront to destroy. Because you, you know, words can destroy. You can just leave somebody slain on the floor. I got my words out, but I destroyed that person. No, that's not the idea. When I talk to them, the idea is to speak with grace from the heart and that grace ought to be on our lips as well, okay? I could be on the other side of that thing. Now, now that is the picture of a faithful witness, okay? Because when I talk, the idea of what I say makes greater impact and how I say it, okay? Grace on my lips, grace uh, on my tongue. Okay, it's the picture of a faithful witness. All right, now, also a couple of statements. Here's a couple of statements here that are very important because in terms of uh, how our speech impacts folks, okay? Now, here's a statement about Jesus. Now, Luke 4.22, of course, this is the account when, you know, here was Jesus in the temple, you know, and Mary and Joseph were looking for him. He was in the temple. And this is what they said. They said, 
and all marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? His speech uh, uh, was just a great testimony to who he was. And this was when he was a young boy. He was a young boy, but his speech made impact. Now, also a statement about us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, the scripture says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The idea is that he says, let no corrupt word. I mean, that could be profane, uh, words that will destroy someone and will not build them up because he uses the words. He says, don't let the corrupt word come out, but let words come out that will edify, that will build somebody up. Because you, even when you confront somebody, you can still build them up while you talk to them. That's what edify means. It means to build them up, to encourage them. Why? That it may impart grace to the hearer. It's all in how you say it. It's all in how you say it. All in how you say it. Confrontation can be good if it's handled correctly. It's got to be handled correctly. Okay, even in marriage, it's got to be handled correctly. You know that always comes up, right? <laughs> okay, it's got to be handled correctly. Okay. Now, why does he use the issue of salt? Because salt is a preservative. It is a purifier. That's what salt does. Um, you know, salt can clean out a wound. It, it can clean out a wound. I remember as a kid, you go to the beach, getting that salt water, and you come out of the water, and that 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 wound is cleaned out because that's what salt does. It's a purifier. And the same thing with our speech. Um, the correct words can purify someone, it can build someone up and can encourage them, okay? It can help to preserve them. Why? See, the call is that our speech be pure. When we talk to someone, it must be pure. Why is that? Because right speech can heal and it can draw. Now, if it's, if it's corrupt speech, you, if anything, you can inflict more pain and push somebody away. The idea is that if I have right speech, not only can I help with the healing, but I can draw them. It's all in words. Words, we don't understand. Words are powerful. We, words can do much, can do much damage, but it can also bring much healing. It can bring much healing. But this tongue, this thing, if it, if it gets out of control and it's, and it's let loose and that wrath comes out, much damage can be done. That's why he says, we got to be careful, <clears throat> prudent character, in character, guard our testimony, even in how we talk, in how we talk, okay? Now, as I said, right speech can heal and draw, but wrong speech will repel. If I didn't use the word can, wrong speech will repel, <laughs> you know? I mean, listen, let's be real about it. How many of us want to be around somebody who has a foul mouth? You don't really want to be around them. We don't. It's going to repel them. Or if all that comes out of their mouth is negativity, it's complaining, all of that, you know, it's going to, it's going to repel people. That, that's what it does. You endure it for a while, but it's like, okay, that's enough. I got to go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you just don't want to be around it. Wrong speech will repel. Okay. Now, a believer's walk and their talk must be in harmony. In other words, what I say must match how I live. And how I live must match what I say. They have to be in harmony, okay? Now, I can be a powerful witness when three things are working together, okay? I can be a powerful witness when three things are working together. Now, what is that? The first thing is my character. See, character points to the idea of what's really going on in me, because what's really going on inwardly will manifest itself outwardly. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. What's going on inwardly will come out, will come out, and most likely it's going to come out in my speech. You know, 
my character. I can be a witness when my character is right, okay? Secondly, my conduct. How do I really live? Does uh, how my lifestyle match what I say? Does my, like, my lifestyle match what I say? And thirdly, my conversation. We just talked about it, which means speech. But if all three of these things are working together, that's how we have a powerful witness before this lost and dying world. Because my character and my conduct and my conversation all line up together. There's no, there's no, <coughs> excuse me, there is no conflict in what people see. Okay? I'm saying one thing, living something else. It's got to line up. It's got to line up. And as I said before, <clears throat> what I say will have far more impact than what I do. But they've all kind of lined up together. They all kind of line up together. How I live, my character, and my conversation. They all have to line up. They all have to line up. Okay? Now, as you move to verses 7 through 18, if we're going to talk about this issue of the team, you know, we're on a team. We all understand that we're on a team. As you know Jesus as Savior, you are on a team. Now, as believers, we're on a team and we're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody has a call. Everybody does. Everybody has a place and a part to play in this thing called the body of Christ. We all do. Okay. Now, I'll read a couple of these verses again. Verse 7 of chapter 4, he says, Tychicus, our beloved brother, faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all things about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you and will make known to you all things which are happening here, okay? But we are called, believers, we're on a team and we're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, here's the real picture. All of us have been called to serve, but this is the real picture, okay? The real picture is, first of all, we have this thing called the 2080 rule, okay? We have the 2080 rule, okay? Now, it means 20% of the people in the church do all the work. That's the case in most churches. You have mostly 20% of the people who do all the work. Not supposed to be that way, but that's, unfortunately, that's the way it is, okay? Okay? Now, the other 80%, they go to church, they enjoy the service, and they leave without ever getting involved. May even have their name on the roll, but have no desire to be involved. But as the body of believers, if we know Jesus, each one of us has a calling. Okay. And, and the truth of the matter is, um, that's this is not the real call for the church. God's desire is that is that 100 percent serves. Uh, but what we have is we have 20% serving 80%. That's not the design. It's 100% serves 100%. Okay, that is God's design for the body of Christ, okay? Now, churches limp along with only 20% of the body functioning. But what more could be done if every member was fully engaged? Think about that. We only have 20% of the body functioning. Now, now, in our own physical body, just think about how we would be if only 20% of our body was working we'd be in real trouble. As we get older, you know, some things stop working as good as they used to. You know what I'm saying? And some things yeah. stop working at all. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All kind of quiet. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? You know. Amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Hey, you know, hey, listen. But, but the God's design is that 100% serves 100%. That is the call, okay? All right? Now, we struggle enough when one thing stops working or is not working 100%. You understand what I'm saying? But, mm -hmm. you know, when we only have 20% of the people doing all the work and doing all of the giving or most of the giving, okay? That's not the call, though. 
Okay, now, here we go. Effective ministry is not a one-man show, but it's a team effort. Everybody in the team has a responsibility. Okay, and we're going to see that here in this text, what happens here, how these men are used. Uh, they serve and they, they help Paul while Paul was in prison, okay? But effective ministry is not a one-man show. It's a team effort, okay? Now, the first man we see is Tychicus, verse 7. He's called the faithful man, verse 7. Because Paul calls him, he says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, okay? He is the faithful man. Now, he's a beloved brother, faithful servant, fellow bond servant, bond servant. Now, he was a Gentile from Asia Minor. That's where he came from, Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And he traveled with Paul at the close of his third missionary journey, okay? So Paul and Tychicus had kind of been, uh, you know, hanging out together for a little while, okay? Okay, also, he's called trustworthy because um, Paul entrusted uh, the letters of Ephesians, Colossians, and probably Philemon uh, to Tychicus, and Tychicus took them to Asia with him, okay? I mean, just imagine, you you entrusted with carrying the parchment, you're entrusted with, trusted with carrying these letters uh, that have become part of the canon of scripture. Think about that, man. You were entrusted with that, why? Because he was a faithful brother, okay? He took them back to Asia. Also, he was sent to relieve Titus in Crete so Titus could join Paul for a while. We see that in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 12, okay? Book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 12. 12 there. Turn there real quick. I want to read that. I just want to read that. <clears throat> he says, verse 12, he says, when I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Okay, he sent Titus to Crete, or oh, he sent Ty uh, uh, Tychicus to relieve Titus in Crete, so Titus could join Paul. Okay, no oh, idea. You know, Tychicus was kind of the relief. Okay, so Paul, so Titus could go there. All right. Also, he also sent him to Ephesus a second time to relieve Timothy of his pastoral duties so Timothy could join Paul, okay? So Titus, Titus Tychicus, his faithful brother, he, could, he was entrusted with uh, even the church that Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus, all right? Go to 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 12, and verse 21. Okay, he says in verse 12, and Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come and the books, especially the parchments. We're talking to Timothy, okay, down to verse 21. He says, do your utmost to come before winter. He says the same thing again. Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren, okay? So Tychicus, Tychicus was a faithful brother. He was entrusted with even pastoral duties uh, in Ephesus, okay? He also ministered to Paul and ministered for Paul to assist him. He didn't just encourage Paul, but he also ministered in Paul's place. Because remember, Paul was in prison. He was in prison. That's why it's necessary to realize that we're on a team. You just never know where God may want to use me, where I may be needed, okay? And look at his next statement. Tychicus, this is Tychicus. He demonstrated that the greatest testimony in the world is dependability. That you be a person that God could finger. Listen, I need to send you here. I need you to go do that. I can, and I can depend on you. I can trust you. This thing, he was entrusted with a church. He stepped in for Timothy and for the church of Ephesus, Ephesus so Timothy could go and go minister to Paul for a short time. Okay, that's powerful. That is powerful, okay? Also, he wasn't an apostle, 
but he insisted Paul is an apostolic ministry. That's a, that's a tremendous statement too, because these days everybody wants to carry the title apostle, which of course is not biblical because that office is not functioning now. Um, but he, he, he functioned as an apostle, even though he, he didn't carry the title. That's the idea. You function and you work and you serve even without a title. That's my office. See, that's, that's, that's the real reward. You know, I don't have to have a title to do whatever God has laid on my heart. Okay. Also, Tychicus didn't have an easy call. Why? He was hanging with Paul. Paul had a lot of enemies. Because, see, and being associated with Paul had its risks. I mean, every time you turn around, somebody was after him because he was preaching the word. And right now, he was in jail for preaching the word. So being around Paul had its risks. Okay? Same thing with, uh, uh, you know, hanging with Jesus. There were risks. I mean, Peter, when Peter was confronted, hey, you wanted them. You wanted them. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. He says, you want them. Why was that? As we were talking about, about the whole issue of speech, is because your speech gives you away. You talk like one of them. Until Peter, until Peter went back to his fisherman's beach, <laughs> then he let him alone. Okay. Yeah. And that's the most. Uh -huh. um, and then in Paul's case, a lot of when, when he was first starting out for a long time, mm -hmm. a lot of people didn't trust him because yeah. he, he had yeah. persecuted so many Jews. Yep. They, they saw him coming. They didn't believe he had been converted. They didn't believe it. Oh, not this guy. Oh, no, not this guy. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, but the, who's that, Gamaleo? Had to go and tell him, no, 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 he's good now. No, you can listen to him. I think it was Gamaleo had to go and tell them that. Because they didn't believe him, that he was, he was, he had been saved and converted. They didn't believe him. Paul had a testimony. I mean, he was there when Stephen was stoned. That the scripture says that he held the clothes. He held yeah. He was there. Yep, he yeah, consented right. to his death. He consented yeah. to his death. He was dead. Watched him get killed. Yeah. Yep. So you yeah. could imagine seeing him come. I, yeah. I understand why none of them want yeah. to believe that you doing what now? Yep. No, <laughs> not, not this guy. Oh no, not this guy. <laughs> but yeah. but Minister Mosley, isn't it amazing that Paul would be the one that uh -huh. Jesus would use? Yeah. Of the yeah. stock of Jews. I mean, yep. he's the Jew of Jews, so astute, learned, and, and and you can only imagine when the Lord illuminated his eyes mm -hmm. so that he can see all of those scriptures that yeah. he had learned and followed, and yeah. here's the fulfillment of all of them, all mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, what, what can you do but be knocked off your feet? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> uh, Barnabas, Barnabas, the encourager, uh, brought him to the saints when when they wanted to reject him. <laughs> yeah, Barnabas, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but, uh -huh, Barnabas, that's right, thank you. Amen. But yeah, but being a real Paul, there were risks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, th I think what he, what he experienced when Jesus taught him uh, over those three years, the Holy Spirit was teaching him. Mm -hmm. It was so dynamic, and that's why he was such a forceful person. It, uh, Looking uh, as the Bible says, uh, neither to the left or to the right, yeah. he was straightforward, and you had to be tough to be with Paul because he oh, absolutely. Was mm -hmm. and, absolutely. And when he knew that you know to to preach Christ would would ultimately lead to his death, that he would suffer many great things, as the Scripture said, oh, yeah. and yeah. to continue yeah. and to continue. Look, when the snake bit me. Yeah. Uh, I might have to slow down my ministry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, right? But but Paul shook that thing off yep. and kept on kept it moving. I mean, shipwreck. Yeah. Oh goodness. How, how many things did he <laughs> yeah. How, yeah. how many things did he face and still mm -hmm. and still went and, and that's why he is a great, he is a great in our eyes because even though he is a man, but we see that he persevered in spite of trials and tribulations. And Amen. then it's still minister to us today. Glory to God. Amen. It reminds me of something I heard Pastor MacArthur say earlier. Um, I went to oneplace.com. Briefly, he said that like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would stood, stood on their ground, trusting God. He said, it's one thing to, to give the lip service about you believe God, you adhere to God, yada, yada, yada. But when you're standing on the threshold of a fiery pit about to be tossed in, and you still don't recant your allegiance to the Lord, 
That's yeah. really saying something. It makes Amen. you think, oh, gee, at what point mm-hmm. would I be like, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. You he, stayed, or what? he stayed focused because mm-hmm. he knew that his victory would come from mm-hmm. the Lord. Yeah. Well, I, I love that great verse. Paul said, listen, for to me, to live is Christ, to yeah. die is gain. Mm-hmm. That's the picture right there. It's, it's all about him. Yes. It's all about him. It's all about mm-hmm. the Lord. So, yeah. I, I always thought, and it's just me thinking this too, that he could never really forgive himself for what he did to people before Christ, before he came to Christ. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. I know. I know he in his testimony when he talked about formally, he talked about what he was formally. Yeah. Um, I, so I don't think he stayed there. He understood where okay. he went a little brought him from. Yeah. But but God used that also that the same zeal he had to kill Christians. Yes. Now God was now using it to edify yes. believers. He turned it. Yes. The same yes. zeal. And so, there is therefore no what he okay. wrote that. There is therefore no condemnation. He wrote that. He right. wrote that. So you know if anybody was going to feel condemned, you know he yeah. would feel condemned. But but yes. he would not give way to the enemy to allow him to feel condemned because he right. knew what God's word said. Oh, hallelujah. That's, right. that's why Paul is in. That's why. That's it. You know? and, and yeah, then, that's all the enemy does. Accuse. He's called the accuser yeah. of the brethren. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's, sister that, in two. <laughs> that, that, that great verse, Romans 8.1, comes right after Romans 7. Now, when he begins to struggle, there's a moment of struggle. The mm. things I want to do, I don't do. The things I should do, yes. all of that. <laughs> yeah. but, then he says, but then he says, there is now no condemnation. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. All that's going on, but this, I no longer condemn because I am in Christ. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, that's that's the issue. I think we all need to do that too because, yes. because listen, let's be real about it. The enemy throws our past in our face. Yeah, yeah you did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, okay. I did. But hey, man, yeah. okay. Hallelujah. Love it under the blood. <laughs> yes. Under the blood. Yeah. And, yeah. and once yeah. again, another wonderful example of him being being a man and yeah. admitting those things that we thought in our hearts, but never really said until we saw him say it. The thing that I will to do, that I don't do. The thing I will not to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Yeah. Who will deliver yeah. me? Yeah. Who? And then, yes, there is therefore no, no condemnation. Yeah. Oh, that's why we need to be in the word every day. We forget, yeah. there's so much, there's so yeah. much more. You know, stuff in the scriptures about what we should look like, what, what our conduct should be. And the mm-hmm. world is coming at you, especially when you're out there every day on a job. It's yeah. all coming mm-hmm. at you all the time. So you need all the time. Of all, but I need it daily and still do, though we're tired. I need daily reminders of what I'm supposed to be looking like. Because you read the word, you go away, you go outside. Somebody yeah. does something that almost caught, brings you this close to an accident. You know, you could go there, you're not. Pray yeah. it up and be you know, mindful of what the word Amen. said. Amen. <laughs> now, when you consider Tychicus, right, and they called him a faithful man, think about this fact. Mm-hmm. He's hanging with Paul, and his travel was not easy. Mm-hmm. Think Amen. about that. He was faithful, and Paul sent him places. Now, did they, did they, did they ever catch a train? Nope. Mm-hmm. Catch a plane? Nope. Nope. No. Nope. Travel mm-hmm. wasn't easy, but they were faithful. Mm-hmm. They were faithful. <laughs> That's, that's why, you know, when, when you look at these guys and you examine their lives, and I look at my life and I think, uh, I might I might have a reward. I might. But these guys, when you see the faithfulness of these guys under those circumstances, that those guys, <laughs> I might have something. I might, I, you know, lay at the feet of Jesus. But these guys will really receive the reward because they kept going no matter what. See, all, all we have to do in these days and time in the body of Christ, all it has to do is rain and we stay home. And we got two cars in front of the house, but we stay home. Come on now. That's why the, the indictment is going to be so great for us as believers. We got two cars. All it does is rain and we stay home. Oh, 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 oh. His travel wasn't easy. They, they, they were in the desert, but I bet there was some rain sometime. Did he stop? Nope. Kept going. Nope. That's why, that's why, uh, our, our accountability before the Lord is going to be so great because he's given us so much and we do so little with it. We do so little with it. Oh, oh. Y'all know, y'all know that's true right about rain. When it rains, 
your attendance drops by at least 10 percent people stay home because it rained but god gave me two cars and i stay home yeah. oh my god oh, snow yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you have to go to, to the mall if you have to go to work you go to work in the rain absolutely and we go to the mall that's right <laughs> amen <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Amen. Amen. Now look at this statement. Tychicus didn't take the easy way, but he took the right way. Because sometimes the easy way is not the right way. Sometimes we got to go through stuff and being faithful. Okay? That's what that statement means. He didn't take the easy way, but he took the right way. And he traveled, what he did, what he was called to do, okay? Now, he was given a twofold commission, a twofold commission. First of all, he had to gather information about the Colossians, okay? He had to gather information about the Colossians. Now, one of the things he had to find out was, how much damage did the cult do? You know, because remember, going back to what this whole, this letter was about, it was about the uh, Colossian heresy. You know, the Gnostics came in and all that false teaching had come in. So how much damage did they really do, okay? You know, how many people had defected? You know, people may have defected to that false teaching, okay? Had other churches taken sides? So the idea is, were, uh, uh, was, there, was there now division in that area because of that false teaching? So... He also had a responsibility to find out that information and report it to Paul. Okay. Okay. But he also had to give inspiration to the Colossians. He had to encourage them. Okay. Give information or inspiration to the Colossians. Uh, why did he need to do that? Because he had to comfort their hearts. Why? Because anytime you see heresy, false teaching, there's going to be damage. It's going to leave scars. So he had to go and comfort their hearts and encourage them. Uh, and that was his call. Okay. Make no mistake. False teaching can do damage. It can do damage. It can bring division. All those things. Okay. You have families divided. And you see that today. I mean, you know, a husband and wife going to two different denominations, to two different churches, and they're divided. Because they're hearing two different things. False teaching can bring damage. One sitting under truth and the other sitting under error. And then, could you imagine that bringing it into the same household? Could you imagine the fights that break out in that household because of false teaching? Okay, families can be divided. The children and children, absolutely. Yep. Minister Mosley, I I knew of a situation in which. Um, uh, and this was sad because the husband was unsaved. The wife was saved, but she went to a church that believed in a lot of physical healings. Mm -hmm. And she had one child. The other child um, died. Or, uh, she wanted to get pregnant and couldn't get pregnant. They said they prayed over and healed her. And it, it just wasn't God's will, but she took it so hard and the witness to her unbelieving spouse it just caused it caused a lot of damage with within her spirit and his yeah and i i don't even know if they ever mm -hmm. got to the point where um they could uh go to church together mm -hmm. i don't know if they ever did because i lost contact with them mm -hmm. it caused mm -hmm. uh you're talking about someone who was wounded yeah. Oh man, my heart just broke for. Her. Yeah, amen. Because they said they healed her. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, amen. I mean, but that's the kind of damage that can be done. Mm hmm. Um, you know, does the Lord still heal? Absolutely. Of course He does, but, but it's not yeah. His will all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And but when you lay hands on a person and make it a big deal or service, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, that's the kind of stuff that can damage folk. It really can. Man's religion. Yeah. Amen. 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 All right. Also, 
We talk, still talking about Tychicus. I mean, this is just Tychicus, okay? The faithful man. Paul called him a fellow servant, okay? He called him a fellow servant. Now, here's the awesome part. Paul had composed the epistle, but Tychicus carried it. Paul needed Tychicus because Paul was in jail. So he composed it, but Tychicus carried it. He carried it. He took it where it needed to go. Okay? Teamwork. We're on a team called to serve Jesus. All of us are. All of us have an important role to play. No matter what it is, it's important. Okay? Now, look at this. He carried a parchment that would be translated into thousands of languages. It would be read and studied and proclaimed by millions of people because of the faithfulness of one man who Paul entrusted to carry it. Oh, think about that, though. Think about that, being called the faithful man. And we're still talking about that parchment today. In fact, we're reading it right now. And the Lord is speaking about it. Because of the faithfulness of one man. Every role, every person has an important part to play on the team and the body of Christ. Everybody is important. Whatever it is, you are important. No big eyes, no little U's, and there's no I in team. There's no I in team, okay? Everybody is important, okay? Now, the next one we're going to talk about is Onesimus. Onesimus, he's called the fugitive man. He's called the fugitive man. Remember Onesimus now. Onesimus was a runaway slave. Uh, the book of Philemon, you know, he... He stole some stuff from Philemon and he left. He ran. He ran into Paul. And uh, Paul led him to the Lord. He's called the fugitive man. Okay. But now he is part of the team. Okay. Now, his name means to be helpful, to be useful, and to be profitable. Okay. Onesimus. Helpful, useful, and profitable. Okay. Now, he's also called in verse nine, he's called the faithful and beloved brethren. He says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brethren, look at this, who is one of you? Who is one of you? At one time he was a runaway slave, now he's a brother in Christ, okay? He's a brother in Christ. Now, he was considered unfaithful by, by Philemon, but his conversion now changes him to faithful. Oh, oh, isn't that good? <laughs> isn't that good? He was considered unfaithful by Philemon, but his conversion now changes him to faith. And that's what Paul wrote the letter to Philemon about. You know, listen, the brother saved now. He's a brother in Christ. Yeah, he stole, but, uh, you know, whatever he owes you, put it on my account. I'll pay it when I see it. That was Paul, okay? Now, faith. Now, as a runaway slave, he has the shadow of death upon him. Yeah, listen, because if a slave, a slave stole from somebody, they could be killed. Okay, they could be killed. But now, he's been pardoned by God, but still has to face the consequences of his sin. All right, he has to face the consequences of his sin. That's what Paul wrote the letter to Philemon about. Uh, just pleading with him, hey, this brother's been saved. Listen, let's, let's talk about it. You know, some way we can work this out. Okay, okay. He has to, but he has to face the consequences. Now, because Paul says to Philemon, he's a beloved brother and one of you. He says, one of you. Okay, go to Philemon real quick. Let's read a couple of verses out. Go to the book of Philemon. Um, right after the book of Titus, right after the book of Titus, okay? Okay, start at, I'm gonna start at verse eight. I won't read all of it, but I'm gonna start at verse eight. He says, therefore, Though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Okay, look at this. Paul says, listen, I can make you do this, but he said, that's not what I want to do. I'm coming to you in love. Okay, he says, so I want to appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the agent, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I, pre I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in chains. In other words, he led him to the Lord while he was in prison who once was unprofitable to you, 
but now it's profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntarily. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, our beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Here we go. I love this. He says, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owe you anything, put it on my account. I love that. I love that. Paul said, listen, I'll take care of it. I got it. I got him. Hmm? That's the doctrine of imputation. Listen, my, my, my sin has been placed on the account of Jesus. He says, Jesus took care of it. That's the doctrine of imputation. Hmm? Oh, my goodness. Good news. Good news. All right. Now. Now, Omnisimus, the fact that he's going back to Philemon to face the consequences proves his faithfulness. Proves his faithfulness. OK, because he knew he knew that he was in trouble with Philemon. And yet he was still going to go back there um, in spite of that. OK, now he also has a dual ministry with Tychicus. He has a dual ministry with Tychicus. Now, what does he have to do? He has to encourage the Colossian Christians. He has to encourage the Colossian Christians. Encourage them in the faith. Encourage them as they recover from this, this false teaching that had tried to take over. Okay? Also, he had to tell them about Paul, how Paul was doing. He, they, they wanted to know how he was doing. Okay? He had a ministry. Now, this account is a picture of the distinction between law and grace. This is the picture of law versus grace. When we see Onesimus, okay? Now, under the law, the law called for punishment for the slave because he stole, okay? That's what the law called for. But now grace allows the master and the slave to fellowship on an equal basis because now they are brothers in Christ. They are brothers in Christ. And this and, is also a picture of, uh, what is it? Uh, mercy prevails over judgment. Yeah, amen. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Okay. Now. Okay, the next brother is the brother by the name of Aristarchus. Aristarchus. Now, Aristarchus is a fellow prisoner. He's a fellow worker. He's called the fearless man. He's called the fearless man, Aristarchus. Now, he was a traveling companion of Paul's. We see that in Acts chapter 19, verse 29. He was a traveling companion of Paul's, okay? He also risked his life in the Ephesian riot. Okay, go to Acts 19. Let's read a little bit of this. Go to Acts 19. And we'll read this, okay? About this brother, Aristarchus. Acts 19. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 28. He says, now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. And some of the officials of Asia, who his friends sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they had come together. And when they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, 
all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and they are pro -counsel. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So that was an uproar. It was a riot. Okay. And Aristarchus was a part of that. He was there and they protected Paul. And Paul wanted to go in there, and they, they held him back from going in there, okay? So he'd been hanging with Paul for a while, too, okay? Now, he was also a cellmate of Paul. I mean, and again, that is the price you pay for your allegiance to Paul. You hang with him, you get arrested, you might get arrested, too. So he wound up being a cellmate of Paul, okay? And also... He didn't look for the easy task. As you can see, if he's going to step in a riot to protect Paul, he's not looking for the easy way out. Okay, he was the fellow prisoner. He was the fearless man. That's what he was called. Now, he suffered and he labored with Paul. He suffered with him. If you were in prison, you suffered. He also labored with Paul in the ministry. Also, it was reported that he was martyred by Nero. Well, of course, you know, Nero, Nero was crazy. I mean, Nero was killing everybody. So, you know, but he was martyred by Nero, okay? And of course, you know, he, you know, Nero you know, even lied on the Christians. You know about the whole issue of Rome and all that stuff. Nero was crazy, okay? <laughs> There's no other way to describe him than that, okay? Uh, he was martyred by Nero. Now, his commitment was an encourage to those who were still fighting the cult in Colossae. All right, now think about that state. Um, he had a greater fight here when he fought against <clears throat> the riot in Ephesus, the Ephesian riot. But yet it was an encouragement to those in Colossae who were battling these false teachers, okay? Because of what they saw in this man, okay? Commitment, you just never know how far a commitment will go, okay? So I think I'm gonna stop here for this week. I'll stop here. And we will pick this up next week as we begin to talk about John Mark. That's this is really an important. This this is this thing about John Mark. We will talk about this next week. This is some good stuff. Okay. But we'll stop here. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you today for this great privilege to come before you, Lord. Again, we thank you for your son, precious Lord Jesus. Again, we just thank you for your word. And thank you for the faith, the faithfulness of those who came before us, Lord. That uh, they're just such an example for us and even a source of conviction for us, Lord. Help us to have a level of commitment to you uh, that will certainly rise above uh, even the uh, times of discomfort. So thank you today for this, again, for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. He is greatly to be praised. Now we can experience the assembling of the saints together. It is such a blessing. It's nothing like it.
because God has created us, has made us depending, independent on one another, because we are not in this Christian race alone. We thank God for his presence, his power, and his Holy Spirit that guides and direct us, and how he encourages us to pray for one another, encourage one another, and don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let's look to him and ask him to do what he has already done, giving us a live testimony of his power and his words that say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Our hearts rejoice. Even as uh, the songwriter said and the singer says, that we shall see you face to face. We thank you again that we can see you through the Holy Spirit and through your word. We thank you that your love is permeating in our hearts and minds because you sent your son, your only begotten son, to die for us. We can say that we are unworthy of such love, but now that you loved us, we can love you. And we desire to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Thank you again for the suffering, death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, overcoming death and the grave, the last enemy that, that uh, uh, the Satan and his these deceitful, deceitful these demons have over us. So now we know that one has come up, raised, been raised up from the dead, has overcome death and went in, I say, went into death and took it, turned it inside out. And so now you, you haven't withhold your son from us. We know that you wouldn't withhold any good gift from us. So we thank you again for the privilege of prayer and how you have answered our prayers. We thank you that Jesus ministered in the earth 40 days. They saw his nail pierced hands and his wound inside and all those things that he, he, he to demonstrate his great love for us. Then he ascended to thy right hand, took a seat because he done what he committed, committed himself to do. It was to seek and to save that which was lost. And surely tonight we are the fruit of his work and labor. We thank you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that he sent to cause us to know you, Heavenly Father, because you are spirit. And we, you desire that we must worship, worship you in spirit and in truth. We have no way of knowing a spirit apart from the revelation of yourself. So we thank you for the Holy Spirit that's able to take your word and cause us to do like Moses said in, uh, in, uh, uh, act, I mean, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. He's seeing him who was afar off. Yes, we can see you through the spiritual eyes that you give us as your word permeates our hearts and as we draw nigh to you because you have made a promise never to leave us nor forsake us. So we thank you tonight. We pray that you continue to bless each one corporately and individually. Continue to do what you do. And the Lord call us to see some spiritual things tonight. Open our ears and our minds because we're going to hear and see some things that perhaps we have not seen or have not thought about, but they are true because they come to you, come, come to us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, and I know you do, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. And I'll be reading from verse 19 to verse 31. Reading from Luke chapter 19, New King, New King James translation, Luke chapter 16, verse 19. I'll pause for a moment to get you an opportunity to. I can't hear you, hear you turning your pages, but I know you are. I shall read. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. Verse 20. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue while I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. 
Verse 27, then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to me to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may that he may testify to them. At least they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But this is what Jesus said, verse 31. But he said to him, if they did not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. But one raise rise from the dead. We thank God for the for his word tonight, because that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about a little something. Uh, it's not new to us, but maybe a little different. And I'm going to use a person who I believe was preaching 40 years and teaching this on this message tonight has to do with we, we, will, we will, not, will not be silent. We're going to go back to where we were last week in the way of our, of our, our PowerPoint presentation. And this time, I'll make sure that I cue you in, right? Okay. Now, we talked about cultural Marxism is, is not being imposed on, is, it, it is not being imposed on people on war, but on the battlefield, because Marxism that wins the hearts and minds of people incrementally. In other words, they want to deceive us and to believe in something that is not true. But the gradual transformation of the culture, that's, that's what Luther says, that's what's going on there. People are bombarded with exaggerated and illusionary promises. People exert, prop, ex, ex, accept, people accept propaganda because they want to. I put that in there, that's true. And I, we could talk about this for a long time because this is something that the, uh, our own nature has a, its own desire. And we know in James, it talks about uh, we, we, we are tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires and enticed. And we, if we want to believe something about a particular individual, don't necessarily have to be true. It, it, all we have to do is be prompted or enticed, as it says in James chapter 1, verses 15. And then we can, we can run with it and think it's true. The next thing you know, our, 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 our vision has changed. Jesus I spent some time on the scripture. The, the Lord said, talks about when your, when your darkness becomes light, your light, it is very dark. That could happen easily. People welcome exaggerated propaganda because they are convinced of its benefits. That's the key. And that's what the uh, rich man here, he's, he's convinced that what he has is great. People emotionally identify with the utopia, deceitful promises. They, take, they gotta, the Marxists tell you that if God could be out of the world if God, in, the, in the order that God has set up in the, in the, in the, in the Bible, so far as it, for, for the male head and the, and the female as a, as a, as a helper or wife, uh, they say you got to change that. Uh, and he said, but this is what they offer. They says, uh, no hope and change is what they need. It's what, what the world needs. That's what they, and that's what they offer. They offer it. Income equality. These are the things that they offer, not God. They offer these things. Income equality. Racial harmony. And by the way, it's, what they do is opposite from these things that they say. Justice based on secular values rather than Judeo-Christian morality, and that's the key. This is how, how should we respond to these, uh, these deceitful, exaggerated propaganda lies or deceitful words that they share, that we, we are bombarded with? How, do we, how should we respond? How should the church respond to the, Okay, number one, this is what the Lord said, take heed and be aware of covetousness. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Lead right into what we're going to, right into the, uh, my presentation. Covetousness, what it is, an excessive desire to acquire more and more. Scripture never encourages believers to take back this culture or attempt to replace a secular government with a Christian one. Keep that in mind. That is not what we've been teaching. Being a good citizen who seek to bring about change by voting for the, for the right government officials and laws does not equal taking back culture. Of course, we, I, I'm going to, I read those scriptures last week. We talked about this. I'm not going to go any further with this. Now, our weapons of being, our weapons, our weapon for bringing about change in the, is the good news, is the gospel, not political order or battles. We cannot accept, expect people to have a changed mind before they have a changed heart. That is a fact. Our issues with uh, 
Uh, one, what does we say? The issues of the heart is the heart. The heart issues are the, uh, the heart issues are the heart. What is the difference between the cl classic Marxism in Russia and China are, are, are not known for the, our culture of Marxism in America today. What is the difference between the two, the one they, when they, they composed on the people that had a, a revolution? Karl Marx viewed was the natural law and judiciary which Christian values breed inequality and freedom, greed, and systematic oppression. We talked about this all, we talked about this last week. A fool, this, this is what the scriptures say, a fool has said in his heart there is no God. And this man, Karl Marx, was an was a atheist. Of course, and we know that Romans tell us about how that how it happened really in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Traditional family structures had to be dismantled. That's what I said earlier. And I'm trying to be fast. I'm going to slow down so you can understand what I'm saying. Let me slow my speech. Traditional family structure had to be dismantled before equality and justice be achieved. Judeo-Christian values must be rejected so the state could take control over all wealth so that it could be distributed evenly to everyone. <laughs> believe that. People want to believe that, that kind of stuff. Marxists call for the oppressed to rise up in revolution. In Russia, this was accomplished through violent uprising. Millions of people were killed. See, they can accept me. The reason why, you, if, you, if you saw the news today and that Putin is calling for 300 more thousand, 300,000 more soldiers. You don't, it doesn't matter how many people die in, 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 in Ukraine. It doesn't matter. Because see, they, they don't believe in God. So they go, what he's trying to do is impose his will on, on a group of people. He sees himself as, once he do this, the people will, will everyone will be uh, beholden to him. They will thank him and, and know that he was a great man. But if you think that uh, you're going to shame them, or, or uh, if many people come across the border, die or anything like, they don't care about that in, in a real, in a real sense. They, they, they don't. You think, well, uh, you say, well, after a million come across, no, they're gonna stop. Mm -mm. They have an agenda. Nope. Cultural Marxism in America to do cultural Marxism, cultural Marxism in America to today, to do it to it today, bring about change in America through gradual transformation. And that's what has happened. And it started years ago. And I think we are feeling the brunt of it today. The utopia propaganda progressive agenda embedded in the educational system, here we go, the media, the political process and legal system. God said, a fool this night, your soul may be required. And this is the question we're gonna answer tonight. Where is Karl Marx's soul? And can you know the truth beyond the grave? That's what we're gonna be talking about tonight, but what time we have left. But I had to work fast though. We'll see how far we go. Job asked this question or told us this. He said, a man dies. I can't see it on my own screen. He's laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? That's what he said. We talked about, we saw where a man is right there. We saw that, right? Job, I can't even see this because of my uh, screen. I can't even, okay, here we go. Thank you. The, the Bible record, the Bible record is God has given us his word. And this is what we have to, to go on. And when we talk about what we're going to talk about tonight, this is only, this is all we have. No one else have it. And these are spiritual truths that we would have to re, 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 uh, act on as being true. The Bible record. What is the Bible record? Job said, but man dies and he and is laid away. Indeed, he breaths, he, breath, he breathes his last. And where is he? That's the question. Well, we saw Lazarus and uh, and uh, 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 the rich man. So let's look a little. Let's take a little look at. Let's take a look at. See, now this is what I was attempting to do. See this picture? You said, "What in the world is this?" What? We'll see. When a man dies, this is the grave. See this? See this? This is the grave. Now, our topic tonight is the slippery slope of desire from riches descend beyond the grave. They go beyond the grave. We read the scripture. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And I'm going to stop there and share a sermon that I heard uh, on this subject. And I think it was to give us some clarity and enlighten ourselves on the subject that we're talking about tonight. Pray that my uh, 
CD will work because I had some problems with it earlier, but we shall see. Screen. Here we go. The picture that I showed you, I was going to put it up, up, up so you could follow it along. We'll, we'll, I have it on. We'll look at it after I finish tonight, or if we run out of time, we'll look at it maybe next week. But but I wanted to wanted you to see what we're talking about, but I'm not going to be able to do it tonight. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it tonight because of uh, some technical things that I experienced when I tried to do this. This evening on BBN's conference pulpit, we'll study life beyond the grave. Jason Low Baxter is our speaker this week. He was born in 1903 in Australia, but grew up in England. He gave his life to Christ after reading a sermon by Charles Spurgeon. He surrendered to preach at the age of 19 and attended Spurgeon's College in London. In 1951, Dr. Baxter left the pastorate in Scotland to begin a teaching ministry in America. His travels also took him to many mission fields, doing the work of an evangelist and writing over 26 books. Dr. Baxter went to be with the Lord in 1999 at the age of 96. Here's our message this evening, Life Beyond the Grave. The Bible Doctrine of Life Beyond the Grave. I wish to quote from the book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 14 and verse 10, in which we find this question. Man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Job's question has echoed in the minds of the thoughtful right down the avenue of the centuries. Where do the dead go? Death is man's monster problem. Where do the dead go? Why, when you think of it, what wreckage of the race has death made? This big, little, revolving orb on which we live, what is it but the cemetery of our species revolving through space? The earth is full of the bones of the departed. And uh, there is no retarding the black marauder, death. He stalks. Among princes, as well as among beggars, often his fell stroke is as unanticipated as it is inexorable. Nor is he any respecter of persons. Death stalks in palaces, as well as in cottages. He is ever with us and ever busy. As the disillusioned poet puts it, life's gay stage is but an inch above the grave. And as the Church of England ritual has it, in the midst of life, we are in death. And even amid the silver bells of the wedding morning, there sounds the muffled knell, till death us do part. Seventy persons per minute is our 20th century world's average death rate, which means that for every tick, 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 tick of the clock, some human being is passing out from this mortal body, passing out from this visible world. 
passing out of life on this planet and passing out into, well, into what? That's where the big solemn question mark appears. And where shall we find answer to this question of Job? Man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? From the wisest sages of antiquity, on through the most brilliant days of the Greek philosophers, right down to the ablest reasoners of our 20th century, one looks in vain for any clear or coherent or convincing or conclusive answer from the merely unaided intellect of man. Modern science grows strangely dumb when it comes to this shadowy line between the here and the hereafter. Uncertainty or vagueness or grotesqueness or confessed ignorance, those are the marks of merely human teachers when it comes to this big solemn question where do the dead go? Is there then any reliable source of authentic information on the matter? It is our convinced opinion that there is. We have it here on our pulpit desk this evening, our dear old Bible. Now, it is not part of my present program to start documenting the evidences for the inspiration of the Bible. All I can say, incidental to my theme at this present moment, is this. After 40 years studying the pros and cons for the inspiration and divine origin of the Bible, I, for one, am more persuaded than ever as a matter of intellectual conclusion that the Bible has all the credentials of being what it claims to be, the supernaturally inspired and inerrant and authoritative word of the living God. I also believe that to any open, honest mind, the credentials are logical and scientific enough to convince anybody. Well, we must leave that there. But now, coming to the question, what does the Bible teach about life after death? I make my first observation, namely, that the Bible repeatedly states the fact of an afterlife. If we were to start quoting all the many places where the Bible refers to the afterlife, we'd still be quoting at 12 o'clock tonight. All we can do, therefore, and all that we need to do here, is simply to quote two representative uh, verses from the Bible, uh, verses which represent the very many others. First, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, we find this categorical statement. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. So, after death, there is a judgment, and that judgment settles a destiny. There is a judgment and a destiny beyond. By the way, I call attention to that word once. It is appointed unto men once to die. Could it be that in this church of God tonight, there is some unconverted man or woman, younger or older? If I may anticipate myself momentarily, I believe there are millions of disembodied, departed human beings who, if they had the chance to come back, and reoccupy the mortal body for a little time, if they could only die twice, if they could die a second time, 
they would die as Christian believers. But you can't come back and die a second time. It is appointed, divinely so. It is appointed unto men to die once. And as the tree falls, so it lies. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. Uh, the other text is John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, where we find our Lord himself saying this. Verily, I say to you, the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, that is the voice of the Son of Man, and shall come forth, they that have done good to the resurrection of life. They that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Well now, dear friends, those two quotations will suffice to uh, document our statement that the Bible clearly states, reiteratedly states, the fact of an afterlife. But now uh, let's go further. The Bible also, to a considerable degree, reveals the spheres of the afterlife. When our dear pastor read the scripture to us just now from the 16th chapter of Luke, he told us in that reading how the rich man also died, and as the King James Version translates it, and in hell... He lifted up his eyes, being in torments. If you and I are to have a clear and true understanding of what our Bible teaches concerning beyond the grave, we must understand clearly the biblical usage of that word, hell. I wonder if anybody here could tell me offhand how many hundreds of times the word hell comes in the Bible. No? Well, the fact is, nobody could answer my question put in that way for the fa simple reason that uh, the Bible does not mention hell even 100 times. Does that surprise you to hear some people talk You'd think that the word hell came in every book, on every page, in every paragraph of the Bible from beginning to end. Oh, they say, that's the book that preaches hellfire, as though hellfire were in every paragraph. Well, the Bible certainly does preach hellfire. And one of the things it says is that liars are going there. So we ought to be very careful not to speak untruthfully about the Bible. The fact is that in this, as in all other matters, the Bible is just about the sanest literature we could read. The Bible contains that word hell just 53 times. In all its 1,000, 189 chapters, think of it, the word hell occurs only 53 times. Now let me break that down a little. The word hell occurs in the Old Testament 31 times, and in the New Testament 22 times, making the total 53. Now, uh, in all the 31 occurrences of the word hell in our Old Testament, the Hebrew word is sheol. Now, that's easy to remember because there are no exceptions. I'll say it again. The word hell comes in the Old Testament 31 times, and in every case, the Hebrew word is sheol. So that from now onwards, all of you, even though you can't read Hebrew, you can take it for granted, wherever you find the word hell in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is sheol. Now, sheol 
does not tell us anything about that sphere beyond the grave. It simply tells us that it is there, a mysterious reality. If we are to know anything about Sheol, we, we don't get it from the word itself. We have to get it from the context. But Sheol means the place beyond the grave that we can't see. One of these days, perhaps, you may hear a certain kind of Bible teacher who will tell you that Sheol means only the grave. But I would ask you not to listen to that teacher for this reason. When the Hebrews wanted to refer simply to the grave where the corpse is laid, they had a different Hebrew word in English lettering, Q-E-B-E-R, pronounced Kebir. Now you find Kebir in the singular and in the plural because there can be one grave and there can be many graves. But Sheol, in all its many occurrences in the Old Testament, including the 31 places where it is translated, as uh, as uh, hell, wherever she all comes, it's always in the singular, because when it refers to the grave, it does so as being the symbol of that mysterious beyond. Now you've got it, haven't you? Thirty-one times in the Old Testament, the word hell occurs in our English translation, and always the Hebrew word is sheol. When we come to the New Testament, we find the word hell 22 times. But in the New Testament, it is not always the same Greek word. However, I needn't burden your memories. It's something else quite simple and exceedingly easy to remember. Of the 22 occurrences of the word hell in the New Testament, Eleven times the Greek word is Gehenna, and uh, ten times it is Hades. But in addition to the ten occurrences of Hades, there's another verse in our New Testament where Hades comes, but our translators have rendered it as grave, and it's that great apocalyptic passage, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, speaking of our Lord's second coming, it says, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is thy sting? And where, O... Oh, what's the next word? Grave. Now, in the Greek, it's where, O oh, Hades, is thy victory. So, we may say that uh, 11 times it is Hades, and 11 times it is Gehenna. That's simple enough to remember. <laughs> There's just one other comment to make on that. There is one other place where we have the word hell, at least in our well-known King James Version. And it's in the first epistle of Peter, where it says that God cast the angels that sins, sinned down into hell. The Greek word is Tartaros. He cast them down to Tartaros. And Tartaros is the deepest abyss of Hades. By the way, that's where Satan, Lucifer, Diabolos, the devil, will be flung during the millennium, down into the bottomless abyss, Tartaros, the deepest abyss of Hades. Now, uh, I think that's all the numerical data we need. The word hell comes in the Bible 53 times, 31 in the Old Testament, 22 in the New Testament. Always in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is Sheol, and in the New Testament, ten times it is Hades, and eleven times Gehenna, and Hades comes again in 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, the word hell in 1 Peter is Tartaros. It is important, therefore, in the New Testament to know which word comes in each place. And if you think it's difficult to know, it isn't. It's very easy. And I'll tell you why. The word Gehenna is a shortened form of the gorge of Hinnom. Gehenna. Gehenna. And uh, Gehenna 
which is still there, just outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, Gehenna was the place where the city waste and refuse and animal carcasses were all dumped, and in which there were perpetual fires burning, and from which there were continual fumes arising. And even to us Westerners, it is not too difficult to understand that in the passage of time, Gehenna came to represent, in Hebrew thinking, the final doom of the lost. And our Lord has put his signature to that. Because wherever our Lord uses that word Gehenna, he always uses it concerning the final doom of the lost. That is Gehenna then. As for the word Hades, in the Greek, Hades, it simply means the place you can't see. Now, uh, the Sheol of the Old Testament and the Hades of the New Testament are one and the same. I'll say that again. Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades in the New are one and the same. Gehenna is always used of the final doom of the lost. But Sheol and Hades are never used of the final doom of the lost. And this is the first big comment I want to make concerning what the Bible teaches about life after death. You're listening. You've got it. Gehenna, the final doom of the lost. Hades is not the final doom of the lost. Hades is the place of intermediate detention between the death of the body here on earth and the final general judgment of the race at the great white throne. Oh, you must forgive me if I seem repetitive. It's simply that I want to be as lucid and clear as I possibly can. 53 times the word hell in the Bible. 31 Old Testament, 22 New. In the Old Testament, always Sheol. In the New Testament, 10 times Hades and 11 times Gehenna. Sheol and Hades simply mean the place you can't see. Gehenna is the final doom of the lost. And Hades is the place of intermediate detention between the death of the body here on earth and the final general judgment of the human race at the great white throne. Now, as I was saying, the first crucial thing to note is this. Our Bible nowhere says that at the death of the body, any human soul goes to Gehenna. So that in that sense, no human soul is yet absolutely lost. Perishing? Yes. But in the final Gehenna sense, lost? No, not yet. I made that clear. I'm going to say it again. Our Bible nowhere teaches that at death, the disembodied human being goes to Gehenna. As a matter of fact, the fires of Gehenna are not yet lighted. They belong to the other side of that judgment which is yet to be. And the flames of Gehenna were never intended for human beings, though some will go. What did our Lord say in Matthew 25? Depart ye cursed into the eternal fire prepared for, well, for whom? For human beings? No, prepared for the devil and his angels. And it is a fearful tragedy that any human being will ever go there. Some will, but none have gone yet, because, as I said, the fire of Gehenna is not yet burning. Now, 
that raises two big questions. What does the Bible tell us about Hades? The place of intermediate detention between the death of the body in this life and the final judgment of the race at the great white throne. Well, let's take Hades first. What does our Bible tell us about Hades? And it tells us, first of all, that Hades is a place of consciousness. Going back again to the passage that Dr. Schlafer read, we read about the rich man. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. Now, of course, you don't need anybody to tell you which the Greek word is. He can't have gone into Gehenna. That's the final doom of the lost, and none has gone there yet. So, you rightly infer, and as Dr. Schlafer read, it's the word Hades. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes so he could see, being in torments so he could feel. And he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, so he could know and recognize. And he cried and said, so he could speak, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus, that he may dip his finger in water and cool me, for I am tormented in this flame. He could plead and he could suffer. And Abraham said, so he could hear. Son, remember, so he had memory. In fact, he was remembering his five brothers still on earth. He was thinking about those who were still here. In other words, we have all the indications that this disembodied human being was in Hades without any cessation or interruption or diminution of his mental faculties. We must never think that a body and a brain are necessary to consciousness and thought. Do I need to remind you quickly in passing that the greatest being in the universe, the maker of the universe, doesn't have a body and God doesn't have a brain. God is pure mind, a purely spirit being. And uh, we must never think that being out of the body terminates self-consciousness or in any way diminishes the faculty of human thinking. There was that uh, disembodied, one-time rich man, now uh, a disembodied human being in Hades, in thorough consciousness. <clears throat> the next thing that the Bible reveals about Hades is, it is in two main parts. There may be, there probably are, uh, considerable other subsidiary divisions. But Hades is in two main parts. The one part being separated permanently from the other by what the Bible calls a great gulf fix. The Bible names one part as Abraham's bosom. The other and larger part, it leaves anonymous simply calling it Hades. Now Lazarus, when he departed, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Where does that expression come from? That is easily answered. It comes from the Jewish Talmud. And uh, it is a Talmudic expression corresponding with another well-known word employed by the Jews. That is uh, the word paradise. Abraham's bosom and paradise were names uh, given in Jewish theology to that part of Hades where the souls of the godly in Old Testament times waited with Abraham. And David and all the others who had died in the faith, where they waited for the coming of Messiah's triumph and for their promised resurrection. You remember how the dying felon on Calvary suddenly saw 
our Lord as being indeed the promised royal Messiah deliverer. And he cried, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. To which our Lord graciously responded, Verily I say to thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It is to our Lord's entering into Hades when he left his body as a corpse hanging on the cross that we refer in the creed. He descended into hell. I have recently come across some churches which have scored out that sentence from the creed. I think that's a great pity. If some people are not fond of the word hell, the proper thing is to read it. He descended into Hades. Our Lord descended into that part of Hades, which is called Abraham's bosom or paradise. What of the numberless heathen, the millions and billions of heathen in B.C. times and in Ado Anno Domini history? Where have all those millions gone who never even heard the name of Jesus, never knew a thing about divinely provided salvation? Have they all gone to Gehenna? Not one of them. Not one has gone to final doom. They have all gone into Hades, and they are all there waiting the final general judgment of the race at the great white throne. What of those millions of people in modern Britain and Europe and America? They've lived in the, uh, the sound of the church bells in a land of an open Bible, and yet somehow they've never grasped the truth. They've never come to a crisis of either accepting or rejecting. They've just lived and died, and uh, you're not sure whether they were converted or not. Millions of them. Where have they gone? They have all gone to Haiti, and they will all tarry there as, until, as I keep saying, the final general judgment of the race at the great white throne. What of the angels that sinned? Have even they gone yet to Gehenna? No, they haven't. Let me quote from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Peter says, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. That's where the word Tartaros comes. Cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment. That's clear, isn't it? And there's a parallel verse in, uh, in uh, the epistle of Jude, verse 6. The angels which left their first, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, God hath reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So I'm anxious to get this clearly into your thinking. All human beings who have so far died, with the exception of Christian believers, and about them we shall have a comment soon. All others, all the millions who have lived and died, when they departed from occupation of the mortal body, they went into Hades, and they are still there. Non-believers and unbelievers alike. Unbelievers are those who have known the gospel and have rejected it. Non-believers are like uh, uh, the millions of the heathen. They've never received. They've never had a chance to receive. So they're not believers, but neither are they Christ rejectors. They have not rejected. They simply have not known. They are not unbelievers. They are non-believers. Mm. But whether unbelievers or non-believers, they have all gone, and they're still going with every tick of the clock. Disembodied human beings, they've gone, and they're still going to Hades, the place of temporary intervening detention 
between the death of the body here and the final judgment to come. Am I getting it over clearly? Just uh, say yes. Am I? Right. Well, we'll go a step further. Hades is not only a place of consciousness and divided into those two main uh, areas. Although Hades is not the place of uh, final destiny. Even Hades can be a place of grim imprisonment. I find in the Old Testament words like these from Isaiah 38 verse 10. I shall go to the gates, the gates of Sheol. In Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, God says through the prophet, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. And in that remarkable passage, Isaiah 14, which describes uh, the deposing of Lucifer, we read this. Sheol from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Thy pomp is brought down to Sheol. How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? Thou shalt be brought down to Sheol. Is this the one who made the earth to tremble, that shook kingdoms and made the world a wilderness, and that openeth not the house of his prisoners? Now mark those words. One, gates. Two, power. Three, prisoners. And uh, we have the New Testament equivalents to those. In Matthew 16, verse 13 and onwards, we find our Lord asking the disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And when the disciples have answered, our Lord says, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter, replying representatively for the twelve, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And uh, evidently deeply moved by Peter's avowal, our Lord replied, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, in English, P-E-T-E-R, but in the Greek, P-E-T-R-O-S, Petros, which means a stone or a fragment of rock. Thou art Petros, a mere stone, a mere fragment of rock. And upon this P-E-T-R-A, this Petra, this mighty rock, this rock of ages whom you've just confessed, I will build my church. It's always a remarkable thing to me that that verse of scripture, which the Roman Catholic Church rests almost the whole of its case on, saying that our Lord built the church on Peter, is the very place where our Lord says the opposite. Thou art merely Petros. I am the Petra, you have just confessed, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this rock, mm -hmm. this Petra, this rock of ages, I will build my ecclesia. And the gates, oh, there's that word gates again. And the gates of Hades, didn't I tell you, Sheol and Hades are identical. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You know, I've heard some uh, rousing sermons on that text in which the preacher has said that the church of Christ is to be a militant church storming the gates of hell or Hades. Well, I'm sorry, but you can leave me out of that army. Who wants to break into the gates of Hades? I'm not particularly anxious to break in and find myself there, are you? The Lord never meant that at all. He meant 
that the gates of Hades should never prevail to hold prisoner any of his redeemed people. Well, we must leave that because now at this point we come to a very precious and vital consideration, namely, our Lord Jesus has been down to Hades and the scripture makes very clear that our Lord's going down into Hades has had a simply tremendous effect. Let me revert to a text I have just quoted. First Peter chapter three, verse 19. being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit, in which he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So he's been really down there. He's been right down into Hades, into the part called Abraham's bosom and paradise. But now in Ephesians 4, Verses 7 to 11, we read, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also who ascended up far above all heaven. So our Lord comes down, lives our life, dies as our sin bearer, goes down into Hades, and then he rises. And it says he led captivity captive. And in full accord with Greek permit, we might read it, he led out a multitude of captives. And when our Lord ascended, from Hades back to the Father in heaven, he opened Hades, that part that is known as Abraham's bosom and paradise, and joining in his triumph were all those godly saints of the Old Testament who now ascended with him. And now Hades, uh, Abraham's bosom is no longer a part of Hades, it is the bosom of God's dear son. And paradise is no longer a part of Hades. Paradise is where Christ is in the third heaven. What a thrilling disclosure that is. No wonder our Lord Jesus declared, Abraham saw my day. He saw it and was glad. And no wonder that David rejoiced to exclaim, Thou wilt not leave my soul in Sheol. Thou wilt show me the path into life. In thy presence is the fullness of the joy, and at thy right hand are the pleasures everlasting. Abraham and David and others, under the power of the Spirit, they foresaw what was going to happen, and by and by it really happened, and the spiritual seed of Abraham and David participated in the glorious triumph of Messiah Jesus. When Christ ascended, the gates were flung open and the spiritual seed who had died in the faith, they participated with him. Well, now that brings us to a wonderful disclosure concerning what happens to Christians after death. Returning to that passage in Ephesians 4, it says, Our Lord ascended up above all heavens. Now, the Bible seems to distinguish for our convenience three heavens. The lower heaven of the clouds and the vast intermediate heaven of the stars and the third heaven, the heaven of heavens, which is the abode of God, where uh, the throne and the home and the heaven of God are. And it says that our Lord ascended there. And with that in mind, 
I turn over quickly to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, let me read what Paul tells us there about the third heaven. Listen to this. For, uh, chapter 12. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. Paul, of course, is speaking about himself, and he must have been in some wonderful spiritual elevation of mind. Uh, God knoweth, he adds, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And he goes on, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth, how that he was caught up into. Now he varies the word. Instead of the third heaven, he says he was caught up into paradise. So that now, paradise, as I said, is no longer a part of Hades. Paradise is in the third heaven with the ascended Savior. And in agreement with that, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, to be absent from the body. Now, this is Christian believers. To be absent from the body is to be present in Hades? No. Here's the one wonderful exception. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that when Christians die, there is an immediate transition to the bosom, not of Abraham, but of Jesus, and to paradise, not in Hades, but in the third heaven. Now let me pause and ask you again. Am I getting it over clearly, or am I just mixing you up? Are you getting it? <laughs> Say yes, or out you go. Uh, on a subject like this, it's, uh, it's so easy to think you're being simple when perhaps you're uh, being the, uh, the opposite. Mm -hmm. But there's something else now. Not only has our Lord transferred paradise and Abraham's bosom to his own presence up yonder in the third heaven, he's done something else. He has taken possession of Hades entirely. He has wrested the keys from the hand of the black jailer. For in the first chapter of the apocalypse, in the first of the Patmos visions, when our Lord reveals himself to John, he says this, Revelation 1, verse 18. I am he that liveth and became dead. Mm -hmm. And behold, I am alive again unto the ages. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Hades is where the soul goes, and death is the grave where the body lies. Mm. And our Savior says that now he has the keys of Hades and of death. Brethren and friends, I'm glad that the keys of the grave and of Hades are in the hand that was pierced to save us. Mm. Aren't you? And I'm glad that Satan no longer has the monopoly of death. Our Lord has not only conquered the grave, he has broken the power of the devil. And when our Lord comes, amid the spectacular splendor of his return, then is going to come that wonderful climax. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we who remain shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall be swept skywards to meet him. And when we all meet the returning king in the firmament yonder, we are all going to break out into a wonderful anthem. And this is what we are going to sing. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is thy sting? And where, O oh Hades, is thy victory? There'll be no more sting in death. 
because we'll all have bodies that can never suffer disease or death again. The sting will be gone forever. Where is thy sting, O death? And where, O Hades, is thy victory? There'll not be one of us in Hades, not one. We'll all be there. And we'll be singing about our wonderful deliverance that the gates of Hades have not prevailed to hold one of our Lord's blood-bought people. Do you ever get a holy longing for his second coming to happen? Do you sometimes feel you can scarcely wait mm. to see him sweep down and take the throne and the crown and put the wicked disorders of this world right and reign in global Christocracy? Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Well, I think I'm about through, except a final word. What about non-Christian? As we have said, when non-Christians die, in their disembodied state, they pass into Hades and will be detained there until the final day of judgment. After this present age is over, and after our Lord's millennial empire has encircled the earth, for that wonderful thousand years. After the final insurrection of evil on this planet. And its everlasting abolition from this planet. After the judgment and doom of Satan. The devil. Then will take place. That final awesome general judgment at the great white throne we read about it in solemn terminology in the 20th chapter of revelation i read just a small part and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead, the small and the great, stand before God. And the books were opened, so there's a record debt. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. And here's the basis of the Inquisition. According to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And now, right at the end after the millennium, you see Hades disgorge all the millions who have been detained in it. And uh, the spirit is reunited to the body. And there they stand, all of them, in their millions before the judgment. And death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man. So this is no wholesale consignment to damnation. It is a particularized individual inquisition into the behavior of every human being. They were judged every man according to their works, twice stated for emphasis. And death, that's the grave, and Hades were flung into the lake of fire. There's no more use for them, so they're flung into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Brethren and friends, 
That is Gehenna. That is the final doom of the lost. What that lake of fire will be, who shall say? How many or how few of that immense multitude will go there? Who shall say? Some will. For it says, whosoever was not written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let us not forget this. That lake of fire is the extreme penalty. But it is not the only penalty. If you should ask, well, what about those who don't go to the lake of fire, but they are not saved in the sense that Christian believers are? I can only say what the Bible does not reveal, I won't risk remarking upon. But I do call attention to these solemn words in John 3, verse 18. He that believeth not on the Son of God is judged already. And the Bible makes it very clear that the thing that finally damns human souls is not so much the breaking of the law but the refusing of Calvary's bloodshed to save us. That's the damning sin. He that believeth not is condemned already. So, and this is a solemn subject, isn't it? So I'm asking as I close, my dear friend, do you know this great salvation? Do you have this wonderful Savior? If you're a Christian, thank God. If not, will you open your heart and receive the Savior? Just now. <laughs> So, my friend, have you received the Lord Jesus? As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you have not believed on the Lord, you're condemned already. Trust Christ as your Savior. Repent, turn from your sin, and gladly receive the Lord as your Savior. Year, you'll find help from a biblical advisor at BBN Chat. Yes, uh, I intend to, uh, as I tried, I spoke to Sister Paula, she tried, gave me some instructions, but I, at first I had, I didn't, really, I didn't anticipate having problems with my DB, my player, CD player, which is really my computer I'm using. I was going to walk through this chart here with us, beginning in here, beginning right here. This is the grave, and this is all that he talked about. He talked about, and this is the scripture that he, that he, that he read, and that I read to you from the beginning. You say, well, why and how is this related to us, the subject of we will not be silent? It has to do with greed, remember? We talked about uh, the idea that uh, 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 Greed and, and 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 manipulation was a was part of a, of the idea of erasing Christianity and all of the principles of the Bible, Judeo Christian and, and Christian principles from the culture itself. The whole idea is that uh, it's done by offering man the desires of his heart, which is covetousness. Man's heart is covetous, and he will give up the glory of being a believer in Jesus Christ and an eternal future for some temporary things of which he's willing to uh, deny the very existence of the God who gave himself for him. And so 
when the Lord is talking, if you have, still have your Bible open to, to uh, Luke chapter 16, how does it is related? This is what Jesus thought began to talk about to the Pharisees before he talked about the rich man and Lazarus. Look at 16, 14. This is what he said, 14 and 15. Turn with me to uh, Luke 16 and 14. 14 says, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. Jesus has spoken about a lot of things. Uh, the unjust steward, he talked about the unjust steward. In parable, he talked about many other things to them, but they did not receive him because of their covetousness. They wanted things in the world, but they gave him lip service about the religion, of course, Jewish religion, or things that they claimed that they were for. Look at verse 13. Look at look, look what uh, verse 15 says. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. See, that's the issue. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And then later on, he goes on and talks about the law and the prophets in verse 16. Uh, he, let, me, let me read it. He said, the law and the prophets were until John since the time that the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is perishing and is depressing into it. When he talks about, when he uses the term uh, the law and the prophets, he's talking about the whole, the whole Old Testament, the law and the prophets. Sometimes referred to the law, the law and the prophets, sometimes referred to as the law of books of wisdom in the prophets. But the law and the prophets is talking about the whole bit uh, of penitent, the Old Testament. He goes on. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. And then he goes on, whoever divorces his wife and marry another woman commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Someone as one word we say, one white boy that subject up. Well, he said the issue with, through marriage and divorce is usually money. He's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I guess we're gonna take a break here, but I just wanna make a few few points here before we go, we don't have much time. Again, he he, he, he dealt with uh, all of these uh, 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 words in the Greek, the Hebrew and English concerning hell. And as I said before, this was the area that he was he was dealing with. That this is the grave, and if everything below this is the grave. And this was this is of course this is paradise, and this is of course uh, the words that he used, the parables. I'm sorry, this is paradise, and this is uh, or, or, or 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 this is uh, and then this here is a hell. Okay, and so you see this, and all of this he just explained. I was going to walk myself with you through this as he was explaining it. Maybe get a chance to maybe you have some observations on it. Maybe get a chance to review it just briefly, maybe at another time. But I just wanted you to take a look at it. And I want you to see what he's talking about. He gave us a lot of spiritual admonition. He talked about the heaven, the heavens. He talked about the third heaven. He talked about the second heaven. He talked about heaven itself. He talked about the white throne judgment. He talked about the judgment seat of Christ. That's where that's where we will go. And he's talked about uh uh, the where the angels, the, judge, the angels were placed, they rebelled against God. He got the scripture reference there for that. Then we got here uh, the lake of fire, which is Gehenna, the final resting place. And then we have the white throne judgment. Okay, we're gonna take a we want to pause here now and stop sharing. We stop stop sharing it. Maybe we have some, maybe we have some observations. Yeah. Let's let's look to the Lord again. He hears. Amen. Let us pray. Yeah. Now may the love of God, our Heavenly Father. Something happened. What happened? The grace of the Lord and Savior <laughs> Jesus Christ. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we depart one from another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.